The second speaker is Mark Vinals. He's a graduate PhD from KTH, and then he was a postdoc TIFR. Yep. Uh, and now he is at Technion. And he's an expert in proof complexity and lifting, and he has some really nice results, both in lifting and especially applied to proof complexity, proving time-space trade-offs for proof systems and SAT solving. So it's my pleasure to introduce you. <laughs> so thanks, Tony. And uh, I'm basically going to talk about uh, how lifting can be useful to proof complexity in this talk. Uh, so let's start by talking about proof complexity. Just an easy question. So is this formula over here satisfiable? Any guesses? OK, yes, it is satisfiable. Why is that? Well, here's a satisfying assignment. <laughs> so just uh, check if these uh, six variables, so take each, each of these clauses, and you will find out that this assignment satisfies these clauses. Now here's a slightly different formula. Is this formula satisfiable? <laughs> Who said no? <laughs> uh, can you prove it? <laughs> okay, uh, it's not satisfiable. If you keep asking me, can you prove it? Uh, I will say that I, I, I promise it's not satisfiable. But please don't ask me more. If you really insist, then maybe I will say, okay, enumerate all these uh, two to six assignments, so there are six variables, not so many assignments. Try all of them, you will see that none of them satisfies the, the formula. But of course, this is not a great state of affairs. So we, we would like to have shorter proofs, like just one assignment that everyone can, can verify easily. Uh, so instead of just uh, this enumerating business, let's try to uh, use some logic to find, to find the proof of this, of this formula. So we're going to uh, use the resolution proof system. Uh, look at these two clauses over there in red. You'll see that they share one variable, x32. It's uh, positive in one and it's negative in the other. So now what uh, happens, imagine that there is a satisfying assignment, then at least one of uh, x32 must be either true or false. So if it's false, then the left part of the x31 uh, clause must be true. If it's true, then the left part of x, x22 bar must be true. So we know that in either case, one of the parts is true or the other part is, is true. So we can just go and write this down here. We can, we can have that uh, x32 or x22 bar must be true. So we derived something new from these clauses that we had. And now, of course, we can keep doing that. So now we have a new clause. So maybe we want to do the same reasoning with this new clause and, some of the, and one of the previous clauses, derive something new. And we kept doing uh, this, getting some information. Now, for instance, we, we derive that x11 must be false. Right? So that, that's, that's already quite a lot of information that we, that we have from the formula. And now we can do some different steps, derive that, oh, this variable must actually be true. And that's a contradiction. So this is a bit shorter than enumerating all these two to six assignments, but it's still not great. So let's try to do something different. And this workshop uh, is about extension complexity. Let's do something that has something to do with polytopes. Uh, we're going to talk about the cutting plane proof system. So we're going to take this formula that's encoded, encoded in CNF and re-encode it uh, using linear uh, inequalities. Just like this. So what I did is the, is the following. Uh, I had an OR. Every clause is an OR. That's saying that one of the variables must, must be true. One of the literals, actually. So I just said that, well, then the sum of all the literals must be at least one. At least one of the literals must be true. Just that. But now we have these negative, um, negative variables, negative literals. Um, what does a variable be negative mean here? Well, if they are, the variables are 0 or 1, then to, in order to say that the variable must be 0, we can just write 1 minus the variable, like this. And now we have some constants on the left. Uh, let's put all the constants on the right, and we'll get this formula. And this is our final, final formula. 
Uh, of course, this uh, encodes a polytope, and now this we want to find out whether this polytope has solutions over the over zero one over the integers. Um, so let's do that. So we'll start by doing some uh, some operations on on these uh, inequalities. For instance, we can take these middle inequalities, uh, some of some all of them together, and we'll get this result over here. Uh, now I don't like these twos on the left, so I'm just going to divide everything by two. Uh, but of course, I also don't like fractional numbers very much. So I would like to get rid of that minus three halves. So how do I do that? Well, of course, I could just uh, round down. That's, that's always something that, that's uh, possible to do. But we're not interested in fractional solutions. We're interested in integer solutions. Right? We have a sum of three things, all of which are integers. So we know that the result is an integer. If that integer is greater than some fractional number, well, it's also greater than the integer that's uh, immediately greater than that fractional number. So in fact, I can go and round up. Uh, yeah, since these are negative numbers, rounding up means a yeah, smaller number. Uh, but here, I could do some step using the, the fact that I'm working with integers that I could not do if I had fractional numbers. And this is this rounding. OK. Uh, I can do the similar, a very similar thing with uh, three inequalities below. Now, you might start uh, getting an idea of what is this formula saying. So what do these two inequalities uh, below say, the ones that have three variables? They're saying that the, the sum of these variables must be at most one. What are the three inequalities on the very top saying? It's saying that sum of, sum of some variables must be at least one. So if you've seen the pigeonhole principle before, uh, that is exactly what this formula is saying. OK. So now we can solve this uh, very quickly. Just sum of these two inequalities over here. We'll get that sum of all variables must, must be at most two. Uh, sum all of the, the three inequalities on top. Sum of all the variables must be at, at least three. So this cannot happen at the same time. Get 0 greater than equal than 1. That's a contradiction. OK. And this, we didn't see the previous proof completely, but this is really much shorter than what we could do with resolution. And this was just talking about six variables. Now, if you had n variables, you would see that you can do this in polynomial time. But if you had resolution, you would need exponential length, say. So this is what proof complexity is about. It's about looking at formulas, uh, seeing what's the shortest way that we can prove them using different sets of rules. I didn't talk about the rules too much. We'll care more about which, uh, which objects we're reasoning with than the exact rules. Of course, the rules are very important, but in this talk, I'm going to skip them. OK, so with this being said, let me tell you a bit about a few proof systems. So we talk about the resolution a bit. That was the this proof system where you talk with clauses. Uh, there's another proof system where you translate your formula into polynomials, then you reason with polynomials. That's called polynomial calculus. We've also seen this cutting planes business where you work with linear inequalities. And one other imp important proof system is uh, called bounded de Frege in which uh, you work with AC0 circuits. So your, uh, your lines are, are AC0 circuits. Um, here's a picture of the, these proof systems. This is how they look like uh, when you try to relate them. So resolution is a very weak proof system. Uh, all of these other proof systems can uh, simulate it. Uh, by simulate it, I mean that if you have a proof, a proof in resolution, then you can rewrite it using one of the other proof systems without, uh, without most of the polynomial loss. And we also know that all of these proof systems are strictly better than resolution in that there are some formulas, like the pigeonhole principle before, where one of these proof systems can do it in polynomial length, but resolution needs exponential length. 
And we also know that, for instance, uh, there are formulas that cutting planes can do better than polynomial calculus, or formulas that polynomial calculus can do better than um, bounded at Frege, uh, and so on. So today we'll see some other members of this family, and we'll see uh, a bit more about, uh, on these relations. And for this, we're going to use the lifting technique. So let's talk about lifting now. So in general, uh, as in every other uh, complexity area, we, um, what we want to do with lifting is, well, we know that proving lower bounds is hard, so we want to prove lower bounds in an easier model. And so in this case, we, are, we start with a formula, uh, some formula F, that, uh, that happens to be hard in, in some weak, uh, for some weak measure. Now we're going to lift that formula and uh, to build some new formula F composed with G. Uh, then we have, we have to prove a lifting theorem, but that's a generic lifting theorem that has nothing to do with F, only with uh, G, hopefully. Uh, and that will give us a formula that is, that is hard for some stronger measure. That's the measure that we are really interested in. Now this, if you stay within proof complexity, there are many, there are many examples of, of proofs uh, following this, this idea. And often, you don't really need to prove such a hard lifting theorem. So very often, you, your lifting is just, I don't know, composed with XOR, hit the formula with a random restriction, and now you'll get that the, the formula is, is hard for for some proof system. Um, and many results follow this pattern. But um, today we'll move to the special case where the lifting theorems go through communication complexity. The idea then is that we want to prove that our lifting, our lifted formula is hard in communication complexity, so not for some proof system, and then use, use the hardness in communication to derive that the problem is hard in proof complexity. So we'll not talk too much about one. Uh, yeah, these are usually not too hard things to do. I'll talk about two in a moment. And then uh, after that, we will see a few examples of how to do, well, we want really proof lifting theorems. We will see mostly st step um, how to go from step four to step five. So how to, assuming hardness in, in communication, how to derive hardness in proof complexity. Right then, let's see step two, how do you lift a formula? Our, um, we know how a, a lifting, lifted function looks, that just uh, take a function, replace every variable by, by a, uh, the gadget, here's your new function. In proof complexity, it's basically the same. So we still take a formula, replace every variable with a gadget, uh, but now we have to go back into CNF. Uh, let me tell you what I mean with this. So here's a very simple formula, uh, and I want to lift it with XOR. So I just go to every clause, take a variable, replace that variable by the, the XOR of two, uh, two variables. But now this is not a CNF. So in, instead of, that, of staying with this, uh, we're going to take each of these three Boolean uh, functions and now express them in CNF. So this is what you would do. For instance, the, um, the first uh, lifted clause gets expanded into these four um, clauses and so on. Okay, another, uh, another tool that we will need then is the, um, if we want to, to talk about um, communication problems, well, then we need the communication problem. So let's build the communication problem using, uh, using formulas. The canonical communication problem of a formula or a falsified closed search formula is this. So we start with the formula F, 
and now we are getting an assignment. So F is something that uh, that's given it's in the, in the universe. Uh, everyone can see that. What we, as the people who have the sol to solve a problem, get is this assignment to to the variables of F. And now our task is to give a clause that is falsified by that assignment. Since we will always talk about unsatisfiable formulas, there's always a clause that is fal falsified by the assignment. Uh, so here's an example with that previous formula from before. Uh, X or Y, not X or Y, uh, not Y. Imagine that our input is that X equals zero and Y equals one. Well then, is the first clause uh, falsified? No, it's satisfied. Second clause is also satisfied. Third clause is, is falsified. So we're going to output not Y. So this is basically the problem that we're going to be proving lower bounds for all the time. And to see why, why this is very related to proof complexity, let's see a, a small example of how you can go from a proof to a decision tree. So imagine that we have this uh, a resolution proof of this very small formula from before. And in fact, it's a very special proof because it's tree-like. So if we draw the proof like here in a graph, um, then there are no merging nodes. It's, this is just a tree. Well, in this case, we can very easily take a small proof and convert it into a decision tree for the falsified closed search problem on that formula. Uh, how does this happen? Well, oh, that's, uh, there should be a, a thing on the left should be just a Y without the bar. Okay, so how do we get a contradiction from these two formulas? By resolving over Y. Y is the important variable on the, on the last step. So that means that if we want to figure out, if we have an assignment and we want to figure out which part of the tree, the tree we should go, we should first query Y. So that's what the decision tree does. First query Y. And then it goes into the, right, into the falsified direction. So if the answer is zero, that means that we're falsifying Y, we should go to the left, and vice versa. General structure is a DAG, it's not a big ah. If the general structure is a DAG, then you, can, then you get the decision DAG, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm not telling you more, because actually that's going to be in the next talk. So. <laughs> Okay, and we, we keep asking questions, uh, and at some point we are going to reach the leaves, and these are the, the original clauses of our formula. And now since we've been always keeping a falsified assignment in our, in our tree, we know that whatever clause we reach is falsified, and now we can just go and answer that. Okay, um, this has a problem though, that if we tried to use this idea to prove lower bounds, well, proof cannot be balanced. So we can use this to prove depth lower bounds. That, that's fine. Uh, for example, with respect to y, that is one to creating one for that Yes, so if the last step in your proof is to resolve y, then you uh, query y first. Yeah. So querying x is just an exhaustive step in uh, oh, no, so now how did we get Y uh, from these two clauses? That was by resolving over X. So since we're resolving over X, the next query is over X. And that, that's how it works. Okay, uh, right, so we can use this model to prove depth lower bounds, but if we want to prove something stronger like size lower bounds, then decision trees are not going to work because we cannot balance them. So instead, that's why we want to use communication complexity. Okay, that was uh, the, the introduction. So now let's see a few examples of how to do, use this in the, um, in the real world. So let's start with the 90s. Uh, something that happened a while ago is that people were trying to prove lower bounds for cutting planes. And uh, this was a very hard task. Instead, people try to prove lower bounds for tree-like cutting planes instead. So these are easier to handle. And one of the questions that was, uh, that was open was, what was the relation between 
tree-like and duck-like proof systems. So are tree-like proof systems stronger? And as you can imagine, duck-like proof systems are stronger, but it can happen that having this cutting plane proof system that was uh, very strong, much stronger than resolution, what happens now if you add the tree-like restriction? How does that compare with resolution? Well, then the, the answer is that these, pro these proof systems are actually incomparable. So it turns out that we have some formulas where adding the tree-like restriction to cutting planes much it makes it much worse than resolution. Right? So there are some formulas where resolution has proofs of polynomial length, but that, that, that is duck-like resolution. But cutting planes with, three, the, the, with the tree-like restriction needs exponential length. So to uh, put that in our picture, we have now one, another proof system, tree-like cutting planes. And there are both formulas where tree-like cutting planes is better than resolution and formulas where it is worth, bo uh, worse. And how do we prove this? Well, it must be a lifting theorem, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Yes? The length is the number of lines in, uh, in your proof. But any reasonable measure like number of uh, variables, total number of variables in the proof or something like this will also work. Right, um, so let's talk a bit of, uh, about what's, what's the kind of lifting theorem that, uh, that, that we would need for this. Right, uh, as I said, we want to use communication complexity. So let's see how to do that. Uh, and I'm going to show you, so like before we had this, this resolution proof, we wanted to build a decision tree. Now we're going to have a cutting planes proof, again, tree-like though, and we're going to see how to build the communication protocol for it. Now, since this is a communication problem, the uh, inputs are split between the two players. So in this case, I chose a weird, uh, a weird way to distribute the variables, but uh, when we use lifting theorems, then there's always going to be some more natural way to partition the variables. Usually, that's going to be determined by the gadget. And now what happens is that each player then gets half of the input, half of the assignment, and their task is still to produce one clause that is falsified by this assignment. OK. So let's see how to do this. We start at the contradiction. That's always false. And then we have to figure out where, whether to go left or right. So we're going to pick uh, one of the nodes arbitrarily. So we could both pick the left or the right inequality. That doesn't matter at this point. And now something that we can do is that Alice looks at her variable, uh, um, evaluate her variables, evaluates the, the inequality over her, her input, and sums of the, all of these variables. So in this case, she would just get the value minus one. That's the sum of these three variables evaluated when, so x11 is zero, that doesn't count. x31 minus x31 is minus one, minus x22 is minus one. Uh, minus x31 is zero, the only variable that is not zero is x to two, that's why the answer is, well, that's why she sends a minus one to Bob. Uh, so now Bob has enough information to figure out, to compute the, to evaluate this inequality, figure out whether it's true or not. In this case, it happens to be false. Uh, so since this inequality is false, we, um, and we're always searching a false path, we know that the next step in, uh, in the proof is this node. So now we are uh, moving to this, uh, this inequality in the proof. And now we do the same procedure again. So this has two, uh, two child, pick one of them, no matter which, evaluate it. Bob tells the answer to Alice. In this case, Bob tells to Alice that huh, this equality is uh, satisfied, so we should move to the other one instead. And now they keep doing this uh, until they reach a clause. Uh, okay, and in this case, they are going to reach a linear inequality, but that corresponds to a clause. And then they answer what that, uh, that clause. Uh, one detail, though, is that 
This protocol works great when the coefficients of your proof are quite small. Um, but if you have larger coefficients, then you might want to do something smarter. Uh, you would like to solve the greater than problem, so that is okay. Uh, but then this means that the, the deterministic communication is not going to work great um, because the deterministic communication cannot solve the greater than problem very efficiently. So how could we fix that? Well, we could, of course, use randomized communication. So if we use randomized communication, then, then we can solve greater than efficiently. But uh, these are the 90s and we don't have lifting theorems for randomized communication. Uh, so instead, we're going to look at a different communication model that's called deterministic communication with a greater than oracle. What is this model? Well, here we have a third uh, element in the, um, in the protocol, which is this uh, greater than oracle. And now the players, they no longer talk uh, between themselves, now they just talk to the oracle. What they do is send numbers to the oracle, like uh, like this. Uh, we don't charge them for uh, for s uh, sending numbers to the oracle, right? This is they need infinitely many bits to send real numbers. That doesn't that's not a problem. Uh, what we do charge them for is the answers that the oracle gives. So in this case, the oracle says that uh, Alice's number was greater than Bob's number and that cost one bit or one call to the oracle. So if you think for a moment, you'll see that you can simulate normal communication with this model, and you can also see that um, uh, randomized communication can uh, simulate this model. So it's a good thing in that it's a simpler model, so it's, it might be easier to prove a lifting theorem for it. And that's indeed the case. So. Here's the lifting theorem that, um, that these people proved. What they showed is that the communication cost in this uh, deterministic communication with a greater than oracle model, that's at least the decision tree depth, normal decision trees, so deterministic, nothing special here, uh, times log n, log n is the size of the gadget. And uh, just to give you an idea of uh, how we, one would go and prove this, this is basically the same proof that uh, you would use for the first theorem that uh, Arkadev talked about, the deterministic uh, theorem of Ross McKenzie, Gospitasi, Watson, um, except that you do a crucial but important, important twist to it, which is uh, the following. So in normal communication, when the players send one bit of communication, the inputs get partitioned into two rectangles. And then what the, what the proof uh, of the lifting theorem would do is, well, uh, I always want, want to go to the large zero rectangle. And then, then you, you, you can show that these measures that Arkadev talked about, they don't decrease too much if you always go to the larger rectangle. Uh, here instead, when you send one bit of communication, well, or when you talk to the oracle once, the inputs don't get partitioned into rectangles. They, they get partitioned into something a bit more weird. But not that weird. They get partitioned into triangles. And now what you can do is to look at your triangles. And inside the triangle, you can always find the rectangle. And there's always going to be at least one of the the two rectangles that you can find inside the rectangles is going to be large enough. Not as large as uh, half, but, at le but it's going to be at least one quarter of the size of the inputs. So using this, you can, uh, you can still show that the measures that Arkadev talked about will not decrease too much, and you can prove the, the lifting theorem. Uh, if what I said uh, didn't make any sense, that's no problem. Uh, this only makes sense if you know how to prove a lifting theorem. But uh, yeah, don't worry about it. So that's, that, that's the end of, of this example. Now, yeah, so this is the lifting theorem. What we now need to do is the, then to take a formula, lift it, 
use this lifting theorem to prove that it's hard for communication, and then that, imply, that immediately implies that it's uh, hard for tree-like cutting planes. We have to be a bit careful, though, in that uh, um, I said that we wanted to, to separate two things. So we wanted to say that there were some formats that were hard for cutting planes, but easy for resolution. So when we pick our original formula, we have to be careful that that's an easy formula for resolution, and that when we lift it, it will keep being easy. But this is this can be done. Yeah. So now that we have randomized the Right. No, it, it does. So it's just that you will get a few um, slightly worse numbers from going to random from randomized to to here. Might lose uh, some polynomial factor. So, but uh, no no big deal really. It's just that if you work with uh, the greater than model, that's that's easier to work with and. If you're trying to, it's not so much uh, this kind of lifting theorem. If you wanted to prove new lifting theorems, then it's probably going to be easier to pr prove them in the uh, with a greater than oracle first. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You would uh, you would have to, but you can prove that uh, exponential coefficients are always enough. And that means that, uh, right, so uh, you'll have n many bits, so you, then you can solve uh, greater than in communication login. Yeah. So the motivation, the reason for using this formula was that when you're doing the cutting plane, you say like, the positions might be larger than the like, the mm -hmm. sounds of that might be large. Mm -hmm. But like, when you work with that tree like model, mm -hmm. that you can add steps. Oh no! It, you might go very deep. Uh, that's, so proofs you cannot. There's no need uh, that the proof needs to be balanced. So. Uh, right. No 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 no. I thought the cutting plane method will just add. Yeah, I didn't talk about multiplying, but even just with adding things, uh, they can grow uh, faster quickly. Uh, if, if you're wondering why you might ever want to do that, uh, I'm going to talk about this in uh, shortly. Okay. Um, let Let me also mention something that can be proved for cutting planes using lifting theorems. Which is that, so let's go back to very close to the present. And now it turns out that we can prove lower bounds for duck like cutting planes using lifting theorems. And one way that, that you can prove uh, is that now you can separate this uh, polynomial calculus and cutting planes proof system uh, that we mentioned before. So using a lifting theorem, you can prove that. There are some formulas where polynomial calculus can do great, but cutting planes cannot do that. So just let me uh, show the picture again. So now we have these are over here. Uh, now it is two-sided. So now know that polynomial calculus and cutting planes are incomparable. So instead of talking about this, let, let's talk about the coefficients so that I will answer your question. What do we know about coefficients in, well, not in cutting planes, but in, uh, in Boolean functions? We know that if you have a function that can be represented by uh, linear inequality, then it's enough to use coefficients that are of size at most uh, n factorial. 
And we know that uh, this is in fact tight. So there are some Boolean func functions where you will uh, need very large coefficients. And well, of course, you could ask what happens in cutting planes. Well, then we know that something similar happens. So if you have a formula that has a cutting planes proof of some length L, then you can show that there's going to be another proof whose length is uh, most polyny polynomially larger than my first proof. And uh, whose coefficients are of size at most 2 to the L. Note, by the way, that I'm writing L here, not N. Right, so if L is exponential, this could be really, really large. Can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. When you mean size, you mean magnitude of the numbers or the representation size of the numbers? When I mean size, I mean magnitude. So the representation is log of the size. So uh, you can ask the, a very similar question here then. Do we need coefficients that are this large? Um, could, you, could you just uh, work with coefficients of size 2 to the n? Or maybe even polynomial? But we don't know that. And uh, I find that very annoying. What we, uh, something that we are working on, should be out every day, uh, any day now, is that we can show that large coefficients are needed if you restrict your proofs to be tree-like. We can show something like this, that there are some formulas, if you want to have a tree-like proof, then you're going to either have exponentially long proofs, or you're going to need to use large coefficients. And uh, of course, if you, if you want to be dug like then this does not apply. Um, so what does this mean in our picture? It means that we have this uh, proof system 3P star. Uh, star is a convention that means that uh, cutting planes is using polynomially large coefficients at most. So three like CP star is to like cutting planes with uh, polynomial coefficients. Or um, that would be uh, logarithmically representable coefficients. And now we know that tree, normal tree like cutting planes is uh, strictly stronger than cutting planes with small coefficients. Uh, here's, there's a caveat to this result though, that we only know the lower bound for uh, on, on this result is, uh, is per perfectly fine, but the upper bound is something that we only know to work for the semantic cutting planes proof system. So if, if you know what semantic cutting planes, now you know what the, this means, otherwise don't worry about it. Um, how do we prove this? So remember when we were talking about how to how to convert a cutting planes proof into a, cutting, into a communication protocol that the, we, we had a simulation theorem if we had small coefficients and if we, if we had larger coefficients, then we had to go to this uh, p to the greater than model. So we would like to prove a lifting theorem that works for deterministic communication but fails to work for uh, p to the greater than. And what would be a nice gadget for this? Well, of course, it's something that greater than can do. Like, uh, well, maybe the gadget should be greater than or equality or something like this. Well, let's look at, at equality. And let's think how you would encode uh, using cutting planes that many pairs of variable are, variables are all equal. You could just go and write uh, these two n uh, inequalities, one for two for each uh, for each pair of variables. But you could also try to combine these into one big uh, equality, uh, like this over here. Uh, but now you need to use the uh, very large coefficients in order to use this. So this large equality is just expressing an and of smaller equalities. And now, you can, uh, of course, this is cutting planes. You have to really encode this with two inequalities, but that's not a problem. So it seems that the equality 
that cutting plate is, uh, might be good at uh, using the equality gadget. So if we can build a formula where you have to talk about very large uh, equalities, then that's a formula that might be a good uh, separation. Okay, so let's see how, what kind of lifting theorem do we need for this. Uh, this is a somewhat particular lifting theorem. And this is building on some previous uh, results of Tony and uh, Robert Robert, but uh, adapting this to more gadgets. What we have is that the deterministic communication cost of the solving the search problem on, uh, on f composed with g is at least something called the null standard judge degree that we'll define in a moment. Uh, as long as, as the rank of your gadget, by rank I mean the rank of the communication matrix, is at least n the number of variables over this degree. So for instance, if this degree is uh, linear, then you will be able, be able to work with a constant size gadget. If the degree, in our case, the, the, this degree is going to be something like uh, n over log n. And in that case, we're happy with a gadget that has rank about log n, so size log log n. And what is the null standard judge degree of a formula? Well, we have it over here. So take your formula and interpret it as a set of polynomials. Now, by Hilbert's null standard judge, we know that we can find some other polynomials, gi, so that this happens, sum of fi gi equals one. But of course, we are free to choose different GIs. So we would like to minimize the maximum degree of any of these uh, FIGI expressions. So now, given a, given a set of GIs, their degree is the maximum of FIGIs. And then we want to pick a set of GIs that minimize that. And the minimum is the null standard judge degree of a, of a formula. Yeah. Some of these FIs will include the Boolean axiom. They will. That's probably also why you can always assume that the degree bound for no standard, a trivial bound will be n or something. A trivial bound will be n. Uh, let's instead uh, go towards the future and discuss a few, a few lifting theorems that I would like to, to be proven. So it would be very nice if we could have dark like lifting for intersection of rectangles. Uh, why is that? Well, if you remember that uh, AC0 Frege thing in the family picture that we never talk, really talked about, uh, there's some much stronger proof system that's, or at least stronger proof system, that's AC0 parity Frege. Uh, and it's one of the proof systems for we don't have any lower bounds. And we'd like to, to fix that. But in fact, we don't have lower bounds for something much weaker that's resolution with, uh, with parities. And it feels like for, we should try to prove these lower bounds for resolution with parities first. And a way to do this would be to prove a dark like lifting theorem. I think that we will, might see more details of this in a while. Uh, something that would also help is if we could prove multi-party lifting. This would tell us things uh, about uh, semi-algebraic proof systems, such as sums of squares. Would be very nice if uh, we could prove this lifting theorem I mentioned before, this uh, lifting theorem with the equality gadget using a simulation-based approach. So the, the proof of that theorem is uh, basically algebraic, and there is um, we would like a more constructive proof that uh, you, where you take, uh, take your protocol, build a decision tree. And that is hard because if we use the previous techniques, then they would probably generalize to P2EQ, and we know that that uh, cannot happen. And there's also, the, there's also some work uh, in this by uh, Shaknik, uh, Mohoi Padiai, and Bruno Lof. 
but the, the result does not quite work for, uh, for us. So could one try to get the best of all, both worlds? Why would it be helpful? Well, if you, have, if you had such a simulation theorem, then you, would, you could try to make the, your lifting theorem aware of rounds, or you could maybe try to think of making this dug-like, or at least it, will, it would let us understand this better. Right. Uh, so this is what I think about the feature. Uh, to finish, my main message is that if you can prove a lifting theorem, talk to someone in proof of complexity, I'm sure there's going to have some use for it. Just to understand the family picture that you uh, put mm -hmm. a couple of times, the dashed arrows uh, mean what exactly? Uh, the dotted the and one? the bold ones is clear. Uh, what was the dashed arrow supposed to mean? Uh, okay, you mean the yeah, dashed or the dots? Uh, dashed. Huh. That means that the proof system on top can simulate the proof system on the bottom, as in every proof in the bottom can be done in the proof system on top. Uh, and it, it also means that it's strict so that there's some formula that the one on top can do, but the one on the bottom cannot do. Okay. And now, uh, in this picture, is the community looking at a certain comparison more prominently than other? Or? I, I would say that one of the open questions was, was this, whether uh, what happened uh, over here, uh, that's now solved. Now solved. Um, and there are some other proof systems that are not in the picture, okay. like the, uh, this uh, AC0 parity frege. Right. And I think that that's, that's what people might be looking at next. So it's not known whether AC0 frege can simulate anything stronger than resolution? Oh yeah, it, it, it is known because it, uh, um, it, it can do things that uh, resolution can do, yeah, sure. Yeah, but anything stronger than that, it's not known that AC0 frege can do CP or GCP? No, not, not cutting planes. Yeah, I'm going to say no. In, in, between, in one of your slides, mm -hmm. uh, from a resolution proof, you constructed a decision tree or a decision diagram, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? But the, usually you're looking at unsatisfiable formulas and trying to get a uh, proof that they're unsatisfiable. Can you go from decision trees to uh, resolution proof as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that, that, that conversion was uh, very syntactical. So you, the same thing that you did in one direction, you can do it in the reverse direction. Yes, thanks, Mark. Okay.